as I've already <clears throat> told you, this morning we're continuing uh, the uh, letter to the Romans, and um, what I'd like to do this morning is deal with verses 6 through 13, and I think we're going to uh, find enough material in there to keep us busy for the time that we have. Um, and what, again, what Paul is doing here is he's arguing that God's promise to the Jews have not failed. You know, it hasn't failed. Those promises, he's not failed to keep those things because the majority of Jews are not trusting him, because God never actually promised to save all the natural offspring of Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob. And by extension, neither has he promised to save all of ours. I think we understand that. Okay. Let me begin by reading Romans chapter 9. Uh, I'd like to just read what we read for our text last week. So I'll start in verse 1 and read through verse 13. Paul again writes this through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He says, I am telling the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience testifies with me in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed separated from Christ for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh, who were Israelites, to whom belongs the adoption of sons and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the temple service and the promises, whose are the fathers and from whom is the Christ according to the flesh, who is over all God blessed forever. Amen. Let's not forget that's better translated who is God overall, blessed forever. But it is not as though the word of God has failed. For they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel, nor are they all children because they are Abraham's descendants. But through Isaac your descendants will be named. That is, it is not the children of the flesh who are children of God, but the children of the promise are regarded as descendants. For this is the word of promise. At this time I will come and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but there was Rebekah also when she had conceived twins by one man, our father Isaac, for though the twins were not yet born and had not done anything good or bad, so that God's purpose according to his choice would stand, not because of works, but because of him who calls, it was said to her, the older will serve the younger. Just as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. May the Lord bless his word to um, our edification this morning. Now last week, again, we don't want to miss this. Last week, Paul revealed how deep his love was for the Jews. We've just read about it again, that he would willingly be condemned, separated forever from Christ, if by this, the Jews would come to faith in Christ. Now, the question we asked last week, and, and I, I just wanted to review this quickly because there was one point perhaps I didn't capitalize on that we really should see. And the question we asked was, why did Paul love the Jews so much? Well, Paul says, first of all, because they were his brethren, his kinsmen, his family. Yeah, I mean, we love our family. We love our people. There is a strong sense of unity among the Jews, that they were a people set apart from all the nations of the earth, and Paul was a part of them. They were also God's family. These were the children of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and we're going to see more about that this morning. But these were the people that God had adopted as his own, who had blessed with his glorious presence. Remember the Shekinah? He had made his gracious covenants, gave his perfect law that told them how to live for his glory and the priesthood that would make sacrifices to cover their sins. And it was from them that he raised up the Christ who is not just a man, but who is God in our nature, blessed forever. Now, these are the reasons Paul expresses as to why he loved and cared for them so much. But there was another reason that Paul had this deep affection. One that he didn't express but is always implied for the believer because really all these things could be true 
of, of Paul, you know, again, loving them because they're family members, loving them because, you know, God had been so gracious to them. But those things would not move him at all if it were not for this third thing, okay? And that is because he had the supernatural love of God's Spirit in his heart. That's what takes, you know, the one who takes that truth and applies it to us and makes it real and shows us again the beauty of doing things his way. Now, remember, the Jews had relentlessly persecuted Paul, giving him every reason, humanly speaking, to hate them, but he continued to love them as Jesus had loved them because this is the kind of heart the Spirit creates. You know, sometimes we might forget that our relationship with the Lord is more than just learning about Him, you know, through our Bible study. It's also loving Him. It's being loved by Him. It's loving like Him. You know, one thing that um, uh, Dr. Joey Piper, you know, who was, um, again, a mentor and one of the professors at the seminary that I went to and was the president of Greenville for a while until his retirement, one thing he used to, to uh, emphasize in his ministry is that um, the Puritans were not just about Calvinism and getting all the doctrine right. They were about experiential Calvinism, that we should be experiencing what the Bible tells us is true. And Paul was experiencing that through that love towards the Jews. And that's something that we should be experiencing as well because we know Jesus came into the world not just to take away our sins, but he came into the world to take away our sins so that we would be fit temples for his spirit to dwell in. So that by his Holy Spirit, he might make us more like himself. And again, the way he does that is through that supernatural love that he creates for the things that he loves. Once that love is in our heart, we begin to go that direction. So, so I should say this, we need to cultivate it. It's not going to be automatic. There are things we do that we need to do in order to make it grow. And so may the Lord encourage us to do that. Now, Paul wanted us to know of his deep concern for the Jews before he answers an objection that could be raised by the fact that so many of them had rejected Jesus. And that objection would be this. Doesn't their rejection mean that his promise to them has failed? And if their promise, his promise to them has failed, doesn't that mean that it might fail towards us as well? Can we really have assurance? Well, Paul answers by saying that, you know, perhaps not in a way that we would think, although as Calvinists we would certainly think this, but not the way that many evangelical Christians today would think. He answers the question by saying that God never intended to save all the natural children of Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob. He promised to save the children of promise, and they're known by other names in Scripture, the true Israel of God, His chosen ones, the elect, those whom God has foreloved from all eternity. Now, that, that's again what Paul is arguing here. But let's begin by considering why the Jews had the expectation that God would save the vast majority of them, I think some, perhaps all. First of all, it's because of his promise to Abraham in Genesis 17. Genesis 17, verse 7, God says to Abraham, I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your descendants after you. Well, that, that sounds pretty inclusive. Now, he also said to the Jews at Sinai, and this is what I pointed out when we read the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20, verses 5 through 6, I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children, on the third and the fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing loving kindness to thousands of generations, to those who love me and keep my commandments." Now, God is saying here that, yes, he would withdraw his mercy from the children of those who disobeyed him to the third and fourth generations. You know, that's essentially a curse, isn't it, 
God will curse those who disobey him. But notice he would show his loving kindness, and that means his covenant mercy. The mercies that come through the gracious covenants that he has made with his people, he would extend that to thousands of generations. By the way, <clears throat> we're not even nearly a thousand generations away from Abraham yet um, as far as the history of the world. He would do this to those who loved him and kept his commandments. Well, Abraham loved him. Abraham kept his commandments. He obeyed God. And so they believed God would show mercy to thousands of his generations because of the covenant that he made with Abraham. Now, think about this. Remember what the Jews said when Jesus told them that their father was the devil? They said, Abraham is our father. And what did they mean by that? Well, they meant that because of their relationship to Abraham, their relationship with God was secure. This was one of the things that John the Baptist warned them against when they came out to be baptized by him. In Luke 3, verses 7 through 8, John the Baptist said this, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore, bear fruits in keeping with repentance. And now notice this. And do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham for our father. For I say to you that from these stones, God is able to raise up children to Abraham. Notice again where the Jews were placing their trust. Abraham is our father. Now, some might have fallen away from God over the years, but the Jews believed that if they obeyed the law of God, at least outwardly, and they offered the required sacrifices, God would receive them because they are the children of Abraham. Now, John said, do not place your hope in this. And Paul is essentially telling us that that same thing is true, but in this case, he's using it to prove that God's promise to Abraham has not failed because it's not the natural children of Abraham. God made the promises to. He made the promise to the true Israel, so to speak. So first of all, he sets out to prove that God's promise never guaranteed the salvation of all the children, okay? Not even the children of the patriarchs and with whom God specifically made these covenants, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, he first points to Jacob and his family. He says in verse 6, for they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel. Now, this almost sounds contradictory, doesn't it? But we need to understand that the word Israel, the name Israel, is used in many different ways in Scripture, at least five. It was the name that the angel gave to Jacob after he wrestled with him the entire night. Remember that interesting um, account we have in Scripture. In Genesis 32, verse 28, the angel said to him, your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel... For you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. What does the word Israel mean? One who prevails with God. Now, because the Jews all came from Jacob, you know, from his 12 sons, from Israel, that's what their name was as a nation. That's what God called them, Israel. So you have the man Israel, you have the nation Israel. When Israel was divided by a civil war, remember during the, the days of Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, the northern group was called Israel in order to distinguish it from the southern tribe or the southern kingdom, which was called by the name of the major tribe that occupied that southern kingdom, who was Judah. Okay, by this time, Benjamin had become so small it was incorporated into Judah, so you had Judah and Israel. When the Jews were taken into exile and they returned, they were again collectively called Israel by God. But notice here, Paul gives us a fifth meaning of the word Israel, where he says, not all of Jacob's children okay, are Israel, but there is another sense in which uh, the word Israel is being used, and it's referring to the true Israel and what Paul is, says in this particular passage is this, that it refers to those to whom God has and will fulfill 
his promises. Verse 6, they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel. Okay? In other words, all the Israelites that come from Jacob are not this Israel. These are particular individuals. And that's why God's promise didn't fail, because he fulfilled it to the true Israel. Now, secondly, he points to Abraham's family, his immediate family. He says in verse 7, nor are they all children because they are Abraham's descendants, but through Isaac your descendants will be named. I think sometimes, you know, because of our, uh, the Bible's focus on Isaac, that we sometimes tend to think that Abraham had only one child, and that was Isaac, but he had others. Now, those who know that he had more than one child think he only, thinks he only had two. It was Isaac and Ishmael. Paul right here is, is certainly focusing on Ishmael because what he quotes here is what God said to, um, to Abraham when he said to him, listen to Sarah, when she says, drive out the handmaid, Hagar, and her son Ishmael because it's through Isaac your descendants will be named. Okay, he's talking about uh, zeroing in on this one particular child who is a child of promise. But as I've said, Abraham didn't have just two children. He actually had more than that. He had at least, what is it, um, six more sons by his third wife. Let's not forget that he did marry Hagar. But his third wife, Keturah, whom he married after Sarah died. Moses writes in Genesis 25 too, that she bore to him Zimran and Jokshan and Medan and Midian and Ishbak and Shua. Now these are just the sons that are being named here. He might also have had daughters, but Paul's point is Isaac is singled out as the one child of Abraham to whom the promise applied. He was the child of promise. He was the answer to God's promise to give Abraham and Sarah a son through whom he would fulfill his covenant with Abraham. Okay, so two examples of patriarchs that had many children, but not all were Israel, not all were the children of promise. But finally, he points to Isaac, who with Rebekah had two sons, Jacob and Esau. Before they were born and had done anything good or bad, God said the older would serve the younger, by which he meant that Jacob would receive the patriarchal blessing. His covenant with Abraham would be fulfilled through him and would carry on through him, but not Esau. So favoring Jacob over Esau. And he further says that he loved Jacob, but not Esau. And this without looking ahead to see what either of them would actually do. So we see that the Lord loved Isaac, but not Ishmael or the other sons of Abraham. He loved some of Jacob's children, but not all. And he loved, of course, Jacob, but not Esau. And he fulfilled his promise to those whom he loved. Now, what, what is Paul expressing here? But the same thing he already told us back in chapter 8, verses 29 and 30. Let me read. Those whom he foreknew or foreloved, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And these whom he predestined, he also called. And th these whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. Now, I hope we can understand then what Paul means when he says in verse 8 of chapter 9, it is not the children of the flesh those who were born into the families of the patriarchs or even of New Testament believers who are the children of God, but the children of the promise, those who are foreloved by God, are regarded as descendants. Okay. God's promise hasn't failed. He has redeemed those whom he chose. Now, during the time, uh, you know, from Adam and Eve and basically from Abraham on, those chosen were primarily among the Jews, okay? But Paul is going to go on to show us at the end of this chapter that the true Israel of God, as I showed you in Galatians 6, doesn't include just chosen Jews, 
but it also includes chosen Gentiles. In other words, it's all the elect. Now, I hope, I hope we understand that, okay? Let's move on just for a few moments to apply it. Now, the first and most obvious way is to understand that God's promise to Israel has not failed, okay? That, that's what Paul is arguing. He saved those whom he foreloved, those whom he chose. So, if God's promise to them did not fail, neither will his promise to us fail, okay? If we are the children of promise, then God has saved us and he will keep us and we will see heaven. We will see glory. We can't look at Israel and say, they fell away and so may we. But instead, we should say, God fulfilled his promise to his elect. And so he will fulfill it to us. Now, this does raise a question. And the question is always, for those that are introspective, and we're going to see something about that this evening in the Puritans, how can we know that we really are the elect? Well, we can't know by looking into God's book, the book of life, which is likely not a literal book. Remember we saw last week Moses says, Lord, blot me out of your book if you're not going to forgive them. You know, and then Revelation 20, the book of life was open. Whoever's name was not found written in that book was cast into the lake of fire. We can't go look at that book. And again, it may not be a, necessarily a literal book. It may simply be symbolic of the mind of God. God knows those who are his from all eternity whom he's purposed to save. We can't know the secret will of God. We can't know his decrees until they actually take place. But that's exactly how we can know that our names are written in that book is by seeing what has taken place in our lives. To see if what God says about the elect in the Bible is actually true of us. And what is it that's true? Well, the elect trust Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and Him alone for their salvation. Are we trusting Christ? The elect love Him. Do we love Him? The elect follow Him out of that love and they, they seek to worship Him with, with their whole lives. You know, we may fall short in, in these areas, but the question is, do we have that love in our hearts for Him and His will? Again, Jonathan Edwards boiled it down to that one thing. Do we love God for His holiness? If we do, then we are the elect because only the elect can have this love. The Spirit of God produces it only in the hearts of the elect. And if that's true of us, then we can know He's chosen us. And if we know that, then we know that we're going to make it to the end, even as the true Israel of God. But let's also bear in mind, not only for ourselves but for others, if that isn't true of us right now, that doesn't mean that we're not chosen because the Lord may yet call us to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, that's the first and most obvious uh, application, but there's a, a second and a third, okay? We can apply this to the tendency within reform circles, and here I'm going to step on the toes of some people I know in the Presbytery and maybe not in the Presbytery anymore, who believe that most or even all of our children will be saved, okay? Because of the same reason the Jews thought they would be saved. God is a God to us and to our children. And His loving kindness extends to thousands of generation. Now, I think it's clear from the examples that Paul has given us here that even though God does say these things, that He will be a God to us and our children, He does show mercy to thousands of generations, I think it's clear from these examples that doesn't mean that all the children are going to be saved, does it? I, I don't know how we can deduce that from what we see in the Scripture because out of the eight sons that were born in Abraham's house, only one of them was saved. Out of the two that were born in Isaac's, only one of them was saved. And what about Jacob's children? You know, even though Israel be as numerous as the sand of the sea, it's only the remnant that will be saved. At the time of Christ, very few of Jacob's children were saved, which is why Paul has to raise this argument in the first place. They are not all Israel 
who were descended from Israel. God's promise didn't fail. He just never promised to save all the natural children. So what does God mean when He says that He will be God to us and to our children? I think it means that He will be faithful to deal with us and our children as His people even when we're not faithful to love and serve Him. Now, that can mean a couple of things. He will continue to reach out in His mercy and extend His gospel to our children, to us. But there will come a time when we all have to answer for all that kindness uh, if we don't receive Him. You know, to, to be an apostate, to, to fall away from the church, to have all the blessings that God gives to us that He gave to the Jews and to fall short means that those things will speak against us you know, in that day, and it will speak against our children, too, who had all these, all these blessings but didn't embrace the Lord Jesus Christ. And what about His showing mercy to thousands of generations? Doesn't that mean He's going to save all of our children? Well, obviously not. Again, look at the children of the patriarchs. Sometimes God does that, but not always. And I think from the examples that we see here, it's more likely not always. But what he does mean is this, that he will visit his loving kindness down our successive generations, not to each and every individual, okay, but to some in our lineage if we love him. Okay, Abraham loved him and he obeyed him and God showed mercy to I don't know how many generations from Abraham, okay, but they weren't all saved, but there were some who were. Okay? And that's the reason why any are saved, is because God is showing mercy to successive generations. But there's another position that some of the Reformed persuasion have embraced, and this one is even a little bit more harmful, I think, that God has promised He will save our children, all of them, if we are faithful to raise them in the fear and admonition of the Lord, and if they're not saved... It's because we failed. It's not because God didn't choose them. They have a way of working this out. You know, if, if God has chosen them, He'll give us the ability to be faithful and they will be saved. But if He hasn't chosen them, we won't be faithful and they won't be saved, but it still comes back on us. They weren't saved because we fell short. We failed. Now, if that's true, then Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob failed, okay, Adam failed. Adam and Eve were saved, and look what happened to their children, okay? Samuel, his children did not walk in his ways. David, one in his household, one of his sons raped one of his, one of his daughters, one of his sons rebelled against him and tried to kill him, and it was a mess, okay? All of these failed. A host of people failed. As a matter of fact, who succeeded, right? Well, Paul's last example in particular refutes that idea. If there were ever two children who were raised equally, but with two entirely different outcomes, it was Jacob and Esau, right? Because here are twins, shared the same womb, born at the same time, raised in the same house by the same parents, had the same promises given to them. God was a God to them, just as He was to their parents. They had all the same advantages and all the same disadvantages, and yet Jacob was saved and Esau was not saved. Was that because the parents did a better job with Jacob than Esau? No, that's not what Paul says. Paul says it was because God chose Jacob and foreloved Jacob, but he didn't Esau. Now, God commands us to raise our children in the knowledge of him, the knowledge of his word. But even when we do this faithfully, and none of us does it perfectly, but Faithfully, we, we shared the gospel with them, we taught them right from wrong, we pointed them to Christ, we took them to church. Their salvation still comes down to His choice, okay? It's not what we have done. If we didn't do any of the things we should have done, well, yes, then we can point to ourselves and say we failed. But if we've done it all, we still need to remember that if they were saved, it wasn't because of us, and if they were lost, it wasn't necessarily because of us. It comes down to God's choice. Now, does that mean if our children are not trusting the Lord now, 
and loving Jesus now that they're not chosen and we should just give up on them? Well, no, of course not. Because they could still come to faith in Christ. God may yet have mercy on them. So what do we do? We continue to share with them the gospel. We continue to live Christ before them. We continue to pray for them. The way Jonathan Edwards put it is this, that if our children, when they're younger, you know, can't seek the Lord on their own, the parents need to seek for God to save them because they're not going to seek that. What about when our children grow up and they're not believers? Well, they're not going to seek the Lord on their own still. And so we need to seek the Lord for them, that God may yet have mercy on them. We need to remember that we can't save them. But what's impossible for us is possible with God. And we do need to remember that He may yet show mercy on them. You know, one of the greatest um, heroes of the faith, Augustine, you know, he wasn't saved, I think, until he was in his early 30s. And even at that late date, he still had this, you, the Lord used him tremendously to impact the church. You know, the, 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 the how do we say, the, the last um, word is not said until they actually pass away. So until that time comes, we don't know exactly what the Lord intends. And so we continue to pray, we continue to seek for the Lord's mercy. But again, if you have heard that doctrine, if you have heard that teaching, that it's your fault your children aren't walking with the Lord, you, you really need to look at this passage and understand what it says. It's not you. Okay? It's the Lord. I mean, the Lord, if, if you did a miserable job, God could still save them. If they're His chosen, He will save them. But again, if you've done the best job that could possibly be done, you still can't blame yourself because it ultimately boils down to the Lord's choice. Well, let's uh, take just a moment, shall we, and, and bow in prayer. And particularly, you know, for our children, let's pray that God would have mercy on them. But also that He would help us to see within ourselves, you know, the, the, those marks of His love that assure us that we really have trusted Jesus we are clinging to Him, trusting in Him alone for salvation, and that we will see heaven. Let's pray.